look, we're all going to get lumps and we're all going to get bumps. Um, none of us can predict the future, but we do know one thing about it, and that's that it ain't going to go according to plan. Um, we will all have high highs and big days and proud moments of smiles on graduation stages, father-daughter dances at weddings, and healthy babies screeching in the delivery room. But between those high highs, we may also have some lumps and some bumps, too. It's sad and, you know, it's, it's not pleasant to talk about, but you know, your husband might leave you, your girlfriend could cheat, your headaches might be more serious than you thought, or you know, your dog could get hit by a car on the street. It's not a happy thought, but your kids could get mixed up in gangs or bad scenes. Um, your mom could get cancer. Uh, your dad could get mean. And there are times in life when you will be tossed down the well too, with twists in your stomach and with holes in your heart. And when that bad news washes over you, and when that pain sponges and soaks in, I just really hope you feel like you've always got two choices. One, you can swirl and twirl in gloom and doom forever. Or two, you can grieve and then face the future with newly sober eyes. Having a great attitude is about choosing option number two, and choosing, no matter how difficult it is, no matter what pain hits you, choosing to move forward and move on and take baby steps into the future. There's these three numbers that scare me every single morning I wake up. I think about these numbers every day, okay? Number one, 147. This is the average amount of emails people receive a day today. 147 is the average number of emails the average person is currently receiving. 150. This is the average number of times an average person checks their cell phone a day a day, which means three times you check your cell phone, there's nothing there, because there's 147 times there's an email. But three times, it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't need to check that. Number three, the average person is making 295 decisions a day. 295 decisions a day. Did you have lunch where I had lunch? Hmm, do I want the beef? Do I want the chicken? Do I want the fish? They all look good. Which one do I choose? Where do I sit? Who do I sit with? There's so many decisions. You're making decisions all the time. I mean, I'm driving to work and I'm making decisions. What street do I want to turn? Left, right, here, there. You get on the treadmill, hill, manual, incline. What do I want to watch on the TV? You're making too many decisions. And this decision-making energy in our brain is a finite resource. We only have a limited amount of it, and when it's gone, it's gone. You don't even notice you're using it. And there's only two ways to replenish it. Number one is sleep. And number two is glucose, or anything that turns into glucose in your body, which means at the front of the supermarket, when you're just done choosing 30 different salsas and 20 different kind of eggs, it used to be that there was one kind of eggs, but now there's 20. When you're done choosing your eggs and your salsa, you get to the front, what is there? Piles of candy bars. At the end of the trip, when your decision-making energy is down, they finally hit you with the thing you don't even know you need, but you need it because you just used all of your decision-making energy. Has anyone here ever had the experience of uh, choosing their wedding registry in a big department store? Anyone ever had that? You know, where they give you the tells on gun and you walk around yourself scanning everything? It's fun in the morning, isn't it? Hey, what kind of glasses do we want? Tall ones, short ones, bright, shiny? How many do we need? How many bowls? How many plates? How many forks? How many knives? How many blankets? Do we need blankets? Yeah. Uh, by the end of the day, and my wife and I did this, by the end of the day, we're adding like $300 ice buckets. We never use an ice bucket. We don't need an ice bucket. Never mind a really fancy one. Our decision-making energy is gone. We're making 295 decisions a day. So, to research the happiness equation, I interviewed a number of Fortune 500 CEOs, billionaires, politicians, world leaders, best-selling authors, and I asked them one question. I said, you're a busy, successful person. How do you make all the decisions in your day? How do you create space? Because I know your schedule is busy. And I synthesized the results from all those surveys into one drawing I made for you today. My drawing suggests that every decision you make takes a certain amount of time, and it's of a certain importance. It's either a lot of time, or it's a little. It doesn't take very long. And it's either not very important, or it's a big deal. Every single decision we make is on this chart. So what do we do with those decisions that are low time and low importance? What do the successful people do? Low time and low importance. With those decisions, your goal is to automate them. To automate them. Remember I told you I was trying to decide which way to get to work every day? Now I follow the ways 
crowdsourced traffic app. I don't think about how I get to work anymore ever again. All those decisions, which street, this street, left or right here, I can try to beat the traffic here, listen to the radio for this one, I don't think about. I took 52 decisions out of my day with that one change. A woman came up to me after one of my speeches and said, you know what, that makes a lot of sense because for, for years at work, I was always struggling at lunch. At my office, it was always like, where are you gonna go for lunch today? Do you wanna go here, do you wanna go here? Hey, who's gonna come with it? Who's gonna drive? What do you want on your sandwich? Lettuce, tomato, pickles, we gotta get back. It's like so many decisions about lunch. She's like, now I just have a new policy. It's called double dinners. Every dinner I make, I make double. And the double amount is my lunch left over the next day. It's not rocket science. It takes 32 decisions out of the day for her. My friend Chad has Amazon automatic refills on every single consumable item in his entire house. He never thinks about buying toilet paper again, or paper towel, or soap, or anything. Even towels. He's like, yeah, I figured I'd use a towel like once every 1.5 years. So it auto replenishes. Every 1.5 years, I get a new face towel. <laughs> Like every single thing is automatic for him. It's a decision that for him is low time and low importance. What can you automate in your life? Now, what about those decisions that don't take very long but they're really important? I'm talking about picking your kids up from daycare. I'm talking about saying hi to your team in the morning. This is important stuff, people. You can't just not do it. And that's why my model suggests that you simply have to do it. It's effectuate. It's a big word with a small meaning. It just means get her done. Execute, simply effectuate those decisions. Now, what about the decisions that are low in importance that take a lot of time? These are the ones that bog us down, right? These are the checking 147 emails throughout the day. Uh, it's getting home every night and doing a different chore or errand. These are the ones that actually, actually make us sweat. And this is why I want to tell you that for decisions that are not very important but are taking a lot of time, our goal is to regulate them. Find an invisible fence in your life and put it around those things so they still exist, but they're only fenced in. An example of the person doing a chore every night after work, chores blitz Sunday. Now I only do chores and chores blitz Sunday. My wife and I, our address is 276 uh, on our house. We have something we invented called 276 day. Anything I think should be improved in the house, or anything she thinks should be improved in the house, this hinge is kind of broken. That wall needs a bit more paint. Someone's got to look at the toilet upstairs. You know, We just write it on our 276 day chart. Now one Saturday morning a month from nine to 12, we have it on both of our calendars for the next 12 months, we have 276 day. All we're doing is all those little things that built up. We regulated it and then we don't worry about those things for the rest of the month. It's the same as people that have created an email window. I only answer emails nine to 10 a.m., four to 5 p.m. Guess what? From 10 to 4, I'm email free, right? You regulate it to a part of the day. And guess what happens when you automate, effectuate, and regulate your decisions? You actually have time to debate the ones that matter. You actually have time to think about, to chew on, to wrestle with the where am I going to be, who am I going to be with, where am I going to go? All those things that matter, that affect our lives more than anything else, you can now give them the time and the energy they deserve to properly debate them. The secret to turning your biggest fear into your biggest success. I'm embarrassed to admit this, especially because we're filming this and so it's going to be on YouTube forever, but I'll say it right now for the first time. I didn't know how to swim at all in my early 30s. Okay, I'm 36 now. And why didn't I know how to swim? My sister could swim and everything. It's because I had ear infections my whole childhood. So I had tubes in my ears my whole childhood. And I had a traumatic experience on top of all that. When I fell into the pool and I couldn't swim. So I can, still see, I can almost still see it today. And so that's fine because you know what? Who cares? I don't need to swim. I live in Toronto. There's no ocean. I'm good. I wouldn't even bring my bathing suit to the pool party. Uh, my friends would want to go swimming at university. I hang up by the treadmill. No problem. I eliminated swimming from my life. You see, I didn't think I can do it. I didn't think I had the capability to do it. And I certainly didn't want to do it. You know, I had no motivation. So I never did it. And that's how we think about anything. Right? You gotta have the capability, then the motivation, and then you have the action. I never got to do because I, these things were never gonna happen. All that changed on my second date with Leslie when she said to me over dinner one night, 
so do you like swimming? And I was thinking to myself, uh-oh, play it cool, Pastor Richa. You know, you don't want to scare her off. And I said to her, nah, play it cool. No, nah, I'm not really a big fan. She says, ah, that's too bad. You see, my family's had a cottage on an island for generations. And there's 20 of us up there the whole summer. My 80-year-old grandparents, my five-year-old cousins, we get up every morning in the summer, jump into the lake, and swim around the island. It takes about half an hour. Man, I guess you can't come. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly that night, without thinking about whether I can do it, or whether I want to do it, I just did it. I signed up for adult learn to swim classes at the city of Toronto downtown pool. And I don't know how many people here have seen the downtown city of Toronto pool. This isn't a recommended thing to do. It's like, you know, right, you know, it, right in the urban center of the city. I'm like getting my life jacket, the goggles, whole thing. I'm walking onto the pool tech that first Wednesday night. My heart is beating louder than it had in years. I was so nervous. But you know what happened when I walked in on that pool deck, Rachel? I get out there, I get out there, and you know who's out there? A whole bunch of people who suck at swimming. For once, I'm not the only one. People are from landlocked countries. They had more traumatic experiences than me. <laughs> Trust formed very quickly. So we get into the shallow end with the, with the flutter board, the life jacket, the goggles, and within five minutes of doing that, where I could touch the bottom, I was like, hey, wait a minute. I can do that. Like that, that's, that's not hard. I can do that. And then you know what? The next week, I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it because I was like, well, I, I kind of thought I could do it now. And so the next week, I was like flutter kicking in the deep end. The week after, flutter kicking with no life jacket. By the end of the eight weeks, I was in the front crawl. The thing I realized is that motivation doesn't actually lead to action. Like we all think. Action leads to motivation. It's completely flipped. You want to write that novel? You don't need the perfect coffee shop, the right idea, and an expensive moleskin. Just write one sentence with a pen from the hotel on a post-it note. Just doing that will tell you that you can do it and then you'll want to do it. You want to run a marathon? Forget the good shoes, the right playlist, and the running buddy. Forget it. Just run to the stop sign in your dress shoes. By the time you do that, you're like, I can do that. And then you think you can do it and then you'll want to do it. It's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. Don't just take it from me. You guys are scientists. You probably trust someone like Isaac Newton. You know, uh, He's the greatest physicist of all time, after all. I mean, up there with Einstein. The guy discovered gravity, invented calculus. Pretty good resume. You'd probably be hired at Google these days. And he actually said in his first law of motion, I can remember, like grade 10 science, an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by an equal or greater force. Put another way, if you start doing it, if you place action first, you'll continue. It's harder to stop. And that's why at the end of my adult learn to swim classes, I signed up again. And I signed up again, and I signed up again. And it was the same exact class. I didn't go to learn to swim two. I just did learn to swim one. I'm like, I love this. It's amazing. I can do the front crawl. I loved it so much, I just kept doing it over and over again. It is easier. It is easier to act yourself into a new way of thinking than to think yourself into a new way of acting. Our brains are often the enemy. How do you do it? How do you make your biggest fear into your biggest success? You just do it. You put action first. We all know Nike's slogan, just do it. What you probably don't know is that Nike was an $800 million company with uh, low 20% market share when they came up with this slogan. Then they struck a nerve deep inside of us, something we all believe is true. You know what? On the heels of the slogan, $10 billion company, 50-60% market share. That's over the lifetime of using the slogan. We can remember the ad. They jazzed you up. You're like, I can do that. Just get out there and do it. And it works. It works. Let's go all the way back to 1932, when on a peanut farm in Georgia, a little baby boy named Roosevelt Greer was born. Roosevelt Greer, or Rosie Greer, as people used to call him, grew up and grew into 
a 300-pound, six-foot-five linebacker in the NFL. He's number 76 in the picture. Here he is, pictured with the fearsome foursome. These are four guys in the LA Rams in the 1960s you did not want to go up against. They were uh, tough football players doing what they loved, which was you know, crushing skulls and separating shoulders on the football field. Um, but Rosie Greer also had another passion. Um, in his deep, deeply authentic self, he also loved needlepoint. <laughs> he, loved, he loved knitting. He said that it calmed him down, it relaxed him, it took away his fear of flying, it helped him meet chicks. That's what he said. I mean, he loved it so much that after he retired from the NFL, he started joining clubs, and he even put out a book called Rosie Greer's Needlepoint for Men. And it's a great cover. He's actually, if you notice, he's actually needlepointing his own face. Um, and so what I love about this story is that Rosie Greer is just such an authentic person, and that's what authenticity is all about. It's just about being you and being cool with that. And I think when you're authentic, you end up following your heart, and you put yourself in places and situations and in conversations that you love and that you enjoy. You meet people that you like talking to. You go places you've dreamt about, and you end up following your heart and feeling very fulfilled. I love hanging out with three-year-olds. I love the way that they see the world because they're seeing the world for the first time. I love the way that they can stare at a bug crossing the sidewalk. I love the way that they'll stare slack-jawed at their first baseball game with wide eyes and a mitt on their hand, soaking in the crack of the bat and the crunch of the peanuts and the smell of the hot dogs. I love the way that they'll spend hours picking dandelions in the backyard and putting them into a, a nice uh, centerpiece for Thanksgiving dinner. I love the way that they see the world because they're seeing the world for the first time. Having a sense of awareness is just about embracing your inner three-year-old. Because you all used to be three years old. That three-year-old boy is still part of you. That three-year-old girl is still part of you. They're in there. And being aware is just about remembering that you saw everything you've seen for the first time once, too. So there was a time when it was your first time ever hitting a string of green lights on the way home from work. There was, there was the first time you walked by the open door of a bakery and smelt, smelt the bakery air, or the first time you pulled a $20 bill out of your old jacket pocket and said, found money. Meaningful work seems to be something work. that you, mm -hmm. you seem to suggest is a very uh, common way that people can find happiness. Yeah. Oh, man, I, I, think, I have a really passionate view on work. Um, so basically, I went to high school in Whitby, Ontario, Thank you. Yeah, Whitby's mouse. Okay, that was a lot. There was one woo at first, and then the whole Whitby school bus erupted. Um, and uh, anyway, we had a guidance counselor at my high school mm -hmm. who everybody was in love with, and he was awesome. He high five teenagers in the hallways, mm -hmm. and he was one of those guys that everybody could approach, was accessible to everybody, you know. And we had mandatory retirement. Age 65, vamoosh. You were given the sort of like passage to pension. And uh, uh, we had this ceremony at the school. It, sounded, it was like the Mr. Holland's opus, you know, ending. Um, and the next week after that, he had a heart attack and died. And you know what? When I tell that story, you know the reaction I usually get? It's that, oh. And then it's also, you know, that happened to a brother-in-law of mine. Or I had a, my grandfather also retired, and then, like, it, he just wasn't the same. You hear that more often. So I looked into this concept of retirement. Here's two things I find out that are interesting. Number one, Fortune magazine says the two most dangerous years of your life, physically, are the year you are born, infant mortality over the entire <coughs> lifespan of the human race is 40%. Okay, that's kind of a big number. Uh, better now, but 40%. And number two, the year you retire. Okay, big deal. And then New York Times reports that de incidences of depression spike 40% in that year you retire. So I start looking around the world at this concept of work and of leaving work and mm -hmm. ceasing to work. And here's what I find. Dan Buettner and National Geographic did a study on the blue zones. Some of you may have heard of it. It's the, pe the places around the world where people live like way longer than we do. He studied a place called Okinawa in Japan, where they live on average seven years longer than in North America. And guess what they call retirement? Nothing. They don't even have a word for retirement. Literally nothing in their language describes the concept of stopping work. Instead, they have a word, which I love, called ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I, -I, ikigai, 
which roughly translates as the reason you get out of bed in the morning, okay? What is your ikigai? So I gave my wife two little cards at Christmas last year. We put them on our bedside tables. She's an elementary school teacher at the TDSB. She writes, um, to educate leaders who make a difference in the world, okay? I write, finish writing this book or you know, to increase happiness inside organizations or whatever I'm focusing mm -hmm. on. But it gives you a bit of a direction. Right. It gives you a direction. And so I advise and I recommend you never retire. Mm -hmm. Plus, just to throw in there, retirement was invented. Okay, it wasn't like we used to do this. We invented it in 1889 in Germany when Chancellor Otto von Bismarck just arbitrarily said, hey guys, retirement, age 65. And lifespan was 67. <laughs> now, we all want to retire earlier and we live way longer. Mm -hmm. And so, those years can be vacuous mm -hmm. and they can be troublesome for all the reasons I right. mentioned. So I advise people to have an icky guy mm -hmm. and to find work that includes the four S's, social fulfillment, the structure of getting out of bed in the morning, the stimulation of always learning new things, and the story of being part of something bigger than right. yourself, something you couldn't do by yourself. If you and have those four S's, then you have what I call a meaningful work. If you're not doing the work that you love, how can you tap into that sense of purpose and, sure. and meaning and joy? Great question, and I'm not advocating that someone about to punch out of 30 years in the meatpacking plant sort of punch in for 30 more years. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that. What I am saying is that we all have 168 hours in a week, okay? You have that many, I have that many, Justin Trudeau has that many, Mark Zuckerberg has that many, Warren Buffett has that many. The richest man in the world can't buy more time. It's the one thing that's not for sale. So if you take 168 hours in a week and you divide it by three, you get three buckets of 56. 56, 56, and 56. If you are lucky enough to sleep eight hours a night, and with two small children, I am not, <laughs> but if you are, then that's 56 hours a week, okay? If you work 56 hours a week as whatever job you don't like, mm -hmm. okay, that might be your middle bucket. However, I would still argue that those two buckets justify, create, and pay for your third bucket, the, the whatever you wanna do bucket. Is right. that the where you volunteer? Is that where you're in the church group? Is that where you're doing something you love? And even when the meatpacking plant is over or the gig is done, then, then your bucket can expand and you can keep doing work. The definition of retirement I'm using is ceasing work completely, becoming idle, okay? Yeah. Many people who are like, I'm retirement, mm -hmm. they're like, I love retirement, I volunteer at the hospital, I'm always down at the library, and I do, and I, that you're not retired, you're doing a hundred things, right. okay? So that's what I'm saying, right. it's like keep finding things you love. So I was, I'm 36 now, I, when I was 20 years old, I was going to Queens University, anyone want, want to go to Queens here, this room? Okay, oh, a lot of good queens turn out today. This is good. Um, and uh, I was writing for the campus humor newspaper, Golden Words. It was free. Like, it wasn't a paid job, but I loved doing it. And I loved writing this comedy writing stuff. And so I took, a, I took a little paid internship down in New York City writing for a comedy startup. Simpsons writers, Saturday Night Live writers, living in the Lower East Side. I was like, this is my dream. But it turned into the worst job I'd ever had. Why? Because once I got paid to do something I loved, naturally, suddenly I had constraints. I had to write an article about this topic with this person by this time. And it became so debilitating, like limiting. And I said to myself when I started 1000awesomethings.com, I will never do it for money. I never put an ad on the website ever. 50 million hits, it's only cost me money through URL renewing, you know what I mean? It's, it's never made a cent. And so I was smart about that. I was smart about focusing on the intrinsic motivator of doing something you love, but I was really dumb about starting to focus on stat counters, bestseller lists, how like those extrinsic motivators kept creeping in. And you know what the problem is, Rachel? They creep in to our lives all the time. Right. You, can't, you can get a job for a place you love. Cool, I'm working for a company I believe in. Pretty soon you have a job evaluation, you have a salary. These are all extrinsic motivators and you start targeting your behavior to hitting like, I wanna be a solid performer. That lowers your, your performance. Cause you're like, I just have to get somewhere in the middle and I get my crappy 2% raise. Like, I don't really get much from that. And if they're gonna reward me on that, then the studies all show that those uh, extrinsic motivators actually block you from seeing your intrinsic motivators. Hmm. So Dr. Teresa Amabili at Brandeis University showed that if you have um, girls teach piano to other girls, and you say, do it because you love it and you wanna teach them piano, they do an awesome job. And if you say, we'll give you a movie ticket if you teach piano for half an hour, they stink at it. Hmm. They get frustrated, they, they leave after half an hour. Like, they're just not very good. Right. And so it could be that paying or communicating a numerical value for something actually reduces your own internal motivation. So 
When the Book of Awesome took off, I got hooked on all that stuff because it's so visible, so tangible, so real. And to answer that question for myself with the happiness equation, I drew a new model called the success triangle. Okay, And I say there's three kinds of success. There is sales success, there is social success, and there is self-success. Sales success, how many books did you ship? Like, how many products did you sell? How much money did you make from something? Social success, what do other people think? What's the critical review? Is it nominated for an award, right? Is there a prize associated with it? If it's a movie, does it get an Academy Award? And then self-success, how do you feel about it? And they can contradict. Uh, they contradict, like, um, uh, Hotel Transylvania 2 won a ton of sales, right? Mm -hmm. And zero Academy Award nominations. Mm -hmm. Spotlight, which won Best Picture, had $19 million of box office mm -hmm. compared to over $200 million for Hotel Transylvania 2. Why do I know those numbers? Because they contradict all the time. And so the only way to solve it is to answer it for yourself and focus on self-success. Like, I wrote a letter to my unborn child. I hope he gets to read it one day. And if I can try my best to keep focusing on that mantra, then it absolves me from worrying about, or at least stressing over, things I can't control. My mom is uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. My dad is from Amritsar, India. So they were immigrants to Canada. And when they grew up, they said, Neil, it's real simple. You do great work, then you have a big success, and then you be happy. It's the kind of classic parenting advice. Sometimes I ask people, you know, have you heard this advice before? Have you given it before? And everyone's like, yeah, that sounds normal. You study hard, then you get good grades. And if you're East Indian, you become a doctor, right? right. Or you uh, work really hard, and in the corporate environment, you get promoted, and then you're happy. But the model I like to, really like to put forward is, is a reverse of like a profit-focused model, and instead it's, it's, it's happiness-focused. So, like I said, it's not great work to big success to be happy, it's be happy leading to great work leading to a big success. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you as a leader can invest in your employees' happiness and well-being at the beginning, then we know from all kinds of research. Uh, Sonia Lebomirsky did an incredible um, study based on the uh, book, the, Hap the How of Happiness, that shows that your productivity goes up 31%. If you're in a sales-based role, and most people, well, many people are, they, sales goes up 37%. Creativity goes up three times. This is from just being happy. And then what happens after is you have the big success at the end. I'm talking about career success. You're more likely to get promoted if you're in a good place at work and you have a positive mindset. And also, you live longer. You live about 10 extra years. So, zooming out from profit, like just ignore that for a second. If you actually want those variables, productivity, creativity, sales, out of your employees, the biggest investment you can make is on their happiness at the front side. There's something, a model I, I, I call the 20 for 20 challenge. The 20 for 20 challenge. What I'm trying to say is if you can commit for 20 minutes a day, for 20 days in a row, to do a small, simple happiness exercise, then you can invest in yourself at the beginning. What are some examples? Not all of these, you just pick one, okay? It's a 20 minute brisk nature walk or it's a 20 minute journaling exercise, or it's a 20 minute meditation, or it's committing a conscious act of kindness, a nice email to somebody, buying flowers for somebody, right? Or writing down five gratitudes. Any of those five, remember the nature walk, the journaling exercise, the meditation, the random act of kindness, or the five gratitudes, will invest and convert your positive mindset for the remainder of the day. So, if you are a boss or you're an employee, where's that 20 minutes? I, I guarantee everyone's saying, yeah, I gotta like kind of scoot to this meeting at lunch, or maybe, maybe people say like, you know, I've got to um, go grab a sandwich or something, but very few people say, well, I've gotta go meditate, or I really need to like, you know, commit my random act of kindness or go do my journaling exercise. It's not part of our conversation yet, but yet if we can make 20 minutes of investment in our mental health and our happiness, then we tip over our brains for the remainder of the day and everything else goes up. Like you said, it's the service profit chain, not a, not a, not a new concept, but, but from 20 years ago, we've always known that happy people at work perform better, and as a result, your sales, your profit, everything else lifts. I have a really strong viewpoint on advice, and it's a bit counterintuitive, and here's, and maybe sometimes controversial. The thing is, there's a famous quote um, uh, from the 1800s that says, when we are asking for advice, we're really looking for an accomplice. Okay, we're almost always looking for something to either agree with what we want or disagree with it so we can kind of stand firm in our viewpoint. You ask people what you should name your kid or what school you should go to, you might already have an idea in your mind. And so one day I was surfing through the newspaper and I noticed the cover of the New York Times and the cover of the Toronto Star, the biggest two newspapers in both countries, had the exact opposite advice on them. One said, um, no need to get extra vitamin D because there's been a study and a thousand people have been in this study and all the research says you don't need more vitamin D. The other newspaper said, 
go on the offense and get your vitamin D. None of us are getting enough. The earth's tilting away from the sun. Like, guys, this is a big problem. And I'm like, it's, ex it's like huge credible news sources with studies backing both of them on the front page the same day showing the exact opposite advice. I start thinking about advice, the concept of advice, and start realizing that the most common advice of all is actually cliches. Right. So, so true that you just have them memorized and it's like, you know, the early bird gets the worm, right? But then you start thinking about it, you're like, or is it good things come to those who wait? <laughs> you know, and you start thinking, okay, well, is, it's, it's actions speak louder than words, right? Or is it the pen is mightier than the sword? And for every single cliche or piece of advice you've ever heard, there is an equal opposing piece of advice. So the biggest advice I leave anybody with is don't take advice. The answers are all inside you. You already know what to do. And anything you're seeking is just trying to confirm something you already believe. Forget it. You don't need the books. You don't need the newspapers. You don't need any advice. You already know what to do. Just do that. How do you handle setbacks? It's a great question. And sometimes people say like, do you have setbacks? I'm like, yeah, lots. I mentioned, I kind of joked at the beginning. I'm like, there's tons of failures in there. I think the thing is, you know, if you ask a good photographer, how do you take such good pictures? You know what most of them say? I just take lots. That's what you, you've heard this before. It's like, I just take thousands. So that's why I always get 10 great ones because I take so many more. And like, I think it's like a table with legs on it. That's your life. If you have a table like this with one leg on it, and I know because I was here before and I knocked it over, it can fall over. It can fall over pretty easily. I call that one table. You can think of it in terms of it's up to you. Cash flow streams, if you want. Uh, relationships, if you want. Um, but for me, it's like, how many legs does your table have? So how do I handle setbacks? I try to have a multi-leg table at all times. Like I said, at Walmart, I was doing my blogs and my books. It made me more risk-taking in my writing to know I had a full-time job. It made me more risk-taking in meetings. I was mouthy and asking questions of the CEO because I'm like, yeah, fire me. I got this other thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's two legs on my table. Two legs right there. And then if I add a third thing, a passive income stream, or I'm doing something online, or I'm speaking now, whatever, it's multi-legged. How do I handle setbacks? I look at the other legs. I think about what else I got going on. Let that thing naturally come back. It's okay. Just be doing multiple things at once. To me, that's how I think about it. And it never makes a low feel super low because I'm not all in on anything.